everyone. This is Dr. Laurel Cook, Associate Professor of Marketing at West Virginia University. This lecture is a combination of chapters 1 and 2, customized based on the class responses to the Connect assignments. Some material in this lecture is not included in your text. I am a consumer behavior researcher, so I'll be supplementing these chapters now and for the rest of the semester with brand new and exciting information. Let's get started. Consider this question. Are consumers born or are they made? Which preference do you think marketers would give? Well, obviously, we would expect, ideally, consumers to be made. Those fancy shopping bags, having prices ending in 99, for example, do you think that influences consumer behavior? The answer is definitely. But here is an even greater insight into consumer behavior. When I ask you if you are in full control every time you go to Target or somewhere to shop, how would you respond? Most of us, I believe, would admit to not being in full control. In other words, we admit to being persuaded by the things we see. And this is what makes consumers delightfully irrational. For many years, certainly before the field of marketing was created, economists believed consumers to predict to, and behave very rationally. In other words, they suggested that consumers would not make decisions that weren't in their best interest. But you and I know every time we walk down the cereal aisle, you see a hundred different options. Is it always possible then to make a decision that is quote unquote in our best interest? And the answer, of course, is no. We're limited by many things. Time, our knowledge. Maybe we don't understand the nutrition facts panel on a, on a product. So in other words, consumers are predictably irrational. What this means is, for marketers, we don't have to worry about being unable to predict consumer behavior. Consumers are very weird, which makes them cool and interesting to study. And not all of their behavior is predictable, but marketers have been studying consumers for many years. So what you're about to learn this semester is how much consumer behavior is predictable, even if it's irrational. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're checking out different dating profiles. The guy on the right looks pretty cool, but the guy on the left is predictably going to get a lot more interest. Why? Why is this? Well, this particular phenomena is known as dog fishing. <laughs> yes, that's right. By virtue of just including a dog in your profile picture, you can expect the likelihood to get more interaction to go uh, significantly higher. So yes, this phenomena is real. and It shows you how delightfully weird consumers can be. Let's consider a more nuanced example. If I were to ask you this question and say, a baseball bat and a ball cost $1.10. The baseball bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much would you say the ball costs? Well, as a business student, or as a student at least in this class, you might say, in fact, many people would respond by saying that the ball must cost 10 cents. They'd say the ball would cost 10 cents, and that would require, however, the bat to cost $1.10. You know that's not the right answer now because that total together would be $1.20 and not $1.10. So why do people answer this question incorrectly? The answer is that people often substitute difficult problems with simpler ones in order to quickly solve them. In this case, people seem to unconsciously substitute the more than statement in this problem, for example, the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, with an absolute statement. In other words, the bat costs one dollar. This line of reasoning makes math easier to work with. And if a bat and ball together cost one ten, and the bat costs one dollar, then, using this logic, the ball must cost ten cents. Seems intuitive, and this is the answer most people give. 
Now, let me use the exact same framing with a different example. In this problem, a Ferrari and a Ford together cost $190,000. The Ferrari in this example costs 100000 more than the Ford. If I were to ask you how much does the Ford cost in this case, then you wouldn't be so quick to say, oh, well, then it must cost $90,000. Because you and I both know the Ford in this picture does not cost $90,000. So this incongruence would make us stop and process this sort of information a lot more differently. The answer, by the way, is that the Ford costs 45 and the Ferrari costs 145. Let me give you another example. This was a series of experiments that a behavioral economist um, used to test our preferences for people to see again if this irrationally predictable behavior could be um, understood. So if you have two fictitious faces on the screen, one is Tom and one is Jerry, how might a person pick between them? Well, the answer is this. If you have a slightly less attractive version of Jerry, when you have all three, the top row, more people are by default going to pick Jerry. On the bottom row, if you have a slightly less attractive version of Tom, then more people, when they see the three versions, are going to pick Tom. So, what are the implications here? Well, who do you think you should bring with you the next time you go to a party? Maybe some, someone le slightly less attractive than you. But the major point here is that people can be influenced by the physical world around us. Our behavior can be understood by marketers and better predicted by marketing managers. Let's consider some additional persuasion tactics. Which approach on the screen do you think would work best? If I were to ask you the top option, check the box if you want to earn 200 extra points for writing an essay on the consumer behavior implications of dog fish, fishing, how many people would you say would opt in? The bottom example says check the box if you do not want to earn 200 extra points. Of the two options, which do you think would work best if my goal as your professor is to get people to participate in this extra credit opportunity? Well, the opt out option on the bottom is that correct option. So you can see that applied to the real world. In this case, check the box below if you want to participate in the organ donor program. You may have seen this kind of option when you were last at the DMV. All the PSA materials in the world, all the advertising in the world, like the example at the top of the screen, one organ donor can save eight lives. You would think that would be persuasive and compelling enough to get people to agree to participate in the organ donor program, to opt in. Unfortunately, though, this is not the case. So if we look at examples across the world, you see that organ donations from countries on the left are using an opt-in approach. Other examples, as humorous as this may be, Austria, Belgium, France, and so on, use an opt-out approach and their organ donation percentages are much higher. Let's take another local example. If you were to go to a movie theater and decide between two options of popcorn, a small is $5 and a large is $8.25. If I'm the theater manager and I'm really trying to increase sales of large popcorn, these two options probably are not going to work. Why do you think that's the case? Well, if I'm comparing the cost of the large popcorn with the cost of the small, maybe that $8.25 investment seems not worth it. So what can I do in this case? Well, if I add a si simple decoy, so if I add a medium option for $7.50, you can see mathematically they're not evenly split in prices. But again, if my goal is to increase sales of the large popcorn, then adding the medium option makes large a lot more of a better perceived value. 
So in this example, merely adding the medium popcorn for $7.50 does increase sales of large popcorn. Consider something else you may have seen. For example, when you purchased the textbook for this class, you might have seen a subscription option similar to what you see on the screen. You could have a .com subscription for $59, a print subscription for $125, or a combo subscription for $125. Very similar to what you saw for the textbook. Well, in this case, obviously one of these options is a decoy option. It's meant to push people to, towards the preferred option, in this case the combo option of both print and web. So, throughout the semester, this is a great diagram that we're going to be referencing now and through the rest of the semester that nicely summarizes just about everything we're going to cover in this class. Much of consumer behavior can be explained by looking at these influences, realizing how these influences both internally and externally shape how we feel about ourselves how we believe ourselves to be in our lifestyle, how we enact that self-concept, and how that self-concept and lifestyle then in turn influences how we make decisions. All of this right here is what you need to understand consumer behavior. For now, we'll be focusing on external influences and internal influences. I like to explain the differences here as what's going on upstairs would be your internal influences, all the things going on in your brain, all your memories, what you think of things, all the emotions you're feeling, everything external to you, all the environmental influences, the culture you were raised in, your own demographics, your social standing, all of these are your external influences. And this is where we'll be spending most of our time right now. I like to use this example from Steven Schwartzman. My biggest job really is to figure other people out. I need to understand what makes a person tick. Well, this quote is a good example of the importance of understanding the inside, what's going on upstairs in consumers' brains. And I have some exciting news for you. We can figure that out. We can understand, based on years and years and years of theory, exactly what makes consumers predictable. So, as you might imagine, what's going on upstairs? How you perceive things? The very learning that takes place? Did you know watching your parents use a particular toothbrush, toothpaste brand is one form of learning? The things you remember, the experience, experiences you have, your motives. For example, are you more motivated by external factors like a grade? Or are you more motivated internally, intrinsically? So you just want to do a good job for the virtue of doing your best. Your personality traits, they play a major role in consumer behavior too. How we feel, our emotions, and our attitudes. These are other important factors that we'll cover this semester. On the outside, environmental factors include our culture, a very fascinating topic of subcultures that we'll get into great detail later on. Demographics, our own families, the households we live in, and they don't have to be family members we live with, of course, who we're living with at the time can influence our behavior. And, as you may understand very intuitively, our behavior changes when we're in groups. So when we are in the presence of other people. So again, I like to show this example you see on the screen here, where there's a tip jar that says on a scale of $1 to $10, how attractive are you? Well, this is a clever way of using culture to uh, kind of really manipulate higher tips in this case. Of course, these external influences changes how marketers communicate. So of course, you see in many marketing communications the use of emoji. Can you figure out what this particular PSA is trying to say? This says, I want to fit in, but I don't want to smoke. So again, cultural influences at work. These influences, both the combination of internal factors and external factors, leads to the formation of who we are, our identities. 
Consider what you're wearing right at this moment. You probably have something that's pivotal to your social identity. Maybe it's an athletic brand. Maybe it's the WVU logo. Maybe it's something very, very special from your childhood. All of these things, both internal and external, lead to the formation of our social identities. And these social identities are what marketers really use to predict um, much consumer behavior. Consider this recent example of a social identity known as the meme core. So again, you can see how KFC in this particular example has really benefited from their, from marketers understanding of subcultures in this particular case. And of course, consumer behavior has led to what my forte is. I am a social marketing researcher. This is not to be confused with social media marketing. Social marketing instead is an application of marketing strategies and tactics purely designed to alter or create behaviors that have a positive effect on people or society as a whole. So much of the research examples I'll be using in this class will pull from my research as a social marketer. So you can see how marketing is used in these examples to help consumers. And again, one primary outcome that a social marketer or any kind of positive marketer is interested in is that of consumer well-being. So to pull from my research, consider these examples. We've seen recently changes in U.S. legislation that have led to physical different visual differences in how the nutrition facts panel is visually displayed on product packaging. Why is that? Well, many people weren't seeing the calorie information or didn't understand some nutrient information. And these changes made to the nutrition facts um, panel, for example, they came from marketers. So much of my research and the research of my colleagues led to these changes based on our understanding of consumer behavior. Here's another example, largely pulled from consumer behavior theory. This particular ad you see on the screen right now is a PSA trying to warn people your age of the dangers of tanning beds. So you would say, what's the general point then of consumer behavior? What, what would I do with this information as a marketing manager or a marketing practitioner? When would consumer behavior theories and tenets come into play? Well, it's in the how, what, who, and why of what we do as marketers. So for example, it's how products or services are used. It's even, interest, interestingly enough, in how products and services are disposed of. It includes products, it includes services, it includes experiences. In marketing, of course, and consumer behavior includes ideas. So when you think consumer behavior, don't think the knee-jerk and stereotypical example of just products and or services. This emphasis on experiences and ideas can really help a businessman or woman expand upon the ideas of marketing beyond just the physical. Of course, the application of behavior applies to consumer and society as a whole. So I like to describe this as a micro level analysis, so at the consumer level, or a macro analysis, and that's at the society level. What this means for you as a student is to understand that consumer behavior concepts really help us understand how people act as, individual, as individuals or how they act in groups. And of course, consumer behavior point leads to changes in strategy, what a business might do when they decide to launch a new product. It might even lead to changes in public policy. For example, changes in e-cigarette warnings. Again, those policy changes are a result of our understanding of consumer behavior. Changes in social media and how we inform consumers. Of course, one of the greatest outcome variables that we gain from our understanding of consumer behavior is this, value. Not value in an objective sense, like the cost of a product, but value in a subjective sense, as in perceived value. What is it that makes one person value a type of beverage, for example, more than another? 
It's that perceived value that all of these consumer behavior principles and theories help us as marketing managers understand. Consider a product I spent many days as a marketer selling, power tools. Do you think I really spent much of my time as a brand manager with DeWalt machinery, for example, selling just the drill? No, you may have heard of this concept of total product, but this idea here, total product, is key for your understanding of the point of consumer behavior. In other words, the expression goes like this. Consumers don't want a drill. They want the, what the drill can do. They want, in other words, a quarter inch hole. So again, this idea of total product is you're not really selling the product per se, you're selling what the product can do. So you see how this understanding of total product really shifts your understanding of consumers' perceptions of value. Now let's touch base quickly back with culture again. Because as you know, cultural variations in consumer behavior is an important chapter two concept. So we'll revisit the idea here. When people consider culture and consumer behavior, probably the stereotypical reaction is this. It's primarily where I came from. If I came from the US, my cultural value, values are generally understood to be XYZ. If I came from the EU or somewhere in Asia, then my cultural variations will be assumed to be different. But the important thing here is to understand that there is so much more in cultural variations. So for example, all of these cultural values, and we'll get into the specifics in just a minute, change two important factors that help us as marketing managers understand how people buy the things they do, how people consume the things they do. And those two factors are norms, which specify ranges of appropriate behavior based on those values, and then sanctions, which are penalties for violating those norms. The important thing to take away is that there are other-oriented, environment-oriented, and self-oriented cultural variations. Other-oriented values might include the difference between individual versus collective societies, the differences in age between boomers and Gen Z, for example, a masculine versus a feminine orientation, diversity versus uniformity. There are also cultural variations in nonverbal communication, and that includes time, which is the meaning of time between cultures that may differ based on perspective or interpretation, space, which is the overall use and meanings assigned to space that vary widely among different cultures. Symbols, colors, animal shapes, numbers, all of these have varying meanings across cultures. In fact, failure to recognize the meanings assigned to these symbols across cultures can cause serious problems for uneducated businessmen and women. Relationships. How quickly and easily do cultures form relationships and make friends? Of course, Americans are generalized as tending to form relationships more quickly, whereas in China, relationships are much more complex and characterized much differently. Agreements. How does a culture ensure business obligations are honored? How are disagreements resolved? Some cultures are litigious. So the U.S., you will see a lot of people suing one another. We rely on a legal system to help us with agreements and disagreements. Other cultures rely on relationships, friendships, etc. And then things. The cultural meaning of things leads to purchase patterns that one would not otherwise predict. The differing meanings that cultures attach to things, including products, make gift-giving a particularly difficult task. 